Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog. And this is episode 82, uh, which is the same year I was born, just random uh, fact there, 1982. Uh, but this is episode 82, and this is our 1,000 subscribers episode. And I am just absolutely so grateful. Seriously, like this channel has slowly grown, and there's been months and, and almost most of one year. Uh, I've been on here for about five and a half years now, I think. And uh, and there was like almost a whole year where I didn't post a single thing. And everyone who were like in my first 200 subscribers, uh, they stuck with it. They were like, hey, he might come back and make videos at some point. And I really am thankful that those people stayed. So if you've been here since the beginning, thank you so much. And then after that, when we started doing the Seek and Destroy show and pumping those out. Uh, everyone who jumped on board for that has been great, and I appreciate that support too. Then we went into Gotham City Bricks, and I think I picked up a few people here or there. Uh, then everyone who came over from David the Film Junkies channel, when I invited him to, uh, you know, to go see uh, the the Justice League red carpet premiere with me. Um, you know, of, of course, he, we know the story. He couldn't make it in time, uh, but that video is up. You know, I had a blast there, and I did actually see him there, and we've been keeping in touch, and he actually sent me a really nice congratulations for, cross, uh, you know, crossing 1,000, and I actually watched his video about, you know, like him talking about people, smaller channels like myself and other people who were, you know, struggling to get to that 1,000. He was like, don't freak out. Just stick to the, you know, just stick to your niche. Do your thing, and, and I really took that to heart, and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to just double down on the, the Venom vlog. I'm going to keep making Venom vlog videos uh, and uh, and that's what I've been doing I'm like all right everyone's wanted me to make one kind of video and I tried with transformers in my car but it just got too expensive um, I just can't afford you know toys every week uh, and then got same with Gotham City Bricks I just can't afford to keep buying you know new, new Legos and new things and uh, and when I came to this I was like you know one of my favorite youtubers uh, Alex Yu the region nation um, he follows the transformer movies and he does news updates and he finds like images that are released and things that Michael Bay posts on his Instagram and the people who drive the you know the um, Western Star Optimus Prime truck around the country like he posts all these really great things and things that I never knew about those movies ever and probably never would have known if it wasn't for him making videos on it and I've always wanted to do something like that and so I figured let's do it for Venom. Uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of the character, and uh, Alex already has Transformers covered, so why don't I take care of Venom and uh, and be one of the few channels out there that just post Venom stuff every day. Uh, and thankfully, you guys came on board for that. We had Transformer people come on when I did Transformers in my car, and now we had a tremendous amount of people come on for the Venom vlog. And then, even without the Venom vlog, there were people on Instagram when I when we first heard the news that we needed to get to 1,000 subscribers before Fe February 20th, which we've done. we got four days left, and I, I am just so grateful that we got there. I, I didn't think it was going to happen. I just was like, oh, I'll just keep making videos, and we'll stick to our guns, and if, when it happens, it happens, and it'll be great. Uh, but then people took to Instagram, took to you know social media, who were you know heard me on Harmontown and heard me on other shows, Mad Scientist Party Hour, and other you know, podcasts out there, uh, and Matt Dwyer's podcast, and, and all these great shows that have you know I've been very very thankful to be on. Uh, a lot of these people were like, hey, Seek has a YouTube show. Let's subscribe and like, let's try to get it to a thousand. And you guys, you know, over like the course of two days, got me 150 subscribers. And I, I mean, I don't know what else to say except thank you. Like this, it just means a lot. And I'm glad you guys uh, saved my bacon on this and, and, and pushed me to this point to where I, my channel, I don't think is going to be demonetized. I don't know if there's other stipulations that I didn't meet, but even if not, I mean, this is a, more than enough, more than I could have asked for. Um, I would have been happy with five or ten new subscribers. So to jump from, you know, 630, 640 subscribers um, up to a thousand in like about six weeks, I think it was, uh, you guys are incredible. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, what we're going to do today is something I promised a while ago. Uh, and when we crossed, I think, 800 subscribers, I made a video where uh, I, I told you guys about the time where I stopped that guy who was trying to steal Spider-Man comics. Um, and if you haven't watched that episode, definitely go check that out. Uh, yeah, I actually stopped a criminal from stealing something Spider-Man related. It felt very Peter Parker-ish to do. Um, but my life was threatened, so I was very scared at that moment, too. So it was a, it was a dumb thing to do, uh, but I'm glad it all worked out. And I'm glad I had a story to tell you guys, and I'm still around to tell you that story. Uh, but today is not going to be something so dramatic. Uh, today is going to be something very, very fun and very, uh, hopefully, you guys find interesting. Uh, I am going to share with you in, in a story from 2007. When I first moved to L.A., I worked on a show called On the Lot, which was uh, produced by Steven Spielberg. Um, it was run by Mark Burdett Productions, and, uh, you know, it, it was uh, basically like uh, American 
American Idol, but for filmmakers, indie filmmakers. And it was a great time. I mean, I met a lot of great people on that show, people I'm still friends with today. And uh, two of those guys was Ben Item and James McCoy. And I, don't, I haven't talked to James in years. I don't know what he's up to. Ben, I keep in touch with through social media sometimes. Um, and uh, ben, they're, they're both really great guys. And we all, you know, shared a big love for Spider-Man. And James was like, hey, I'm kind of the outside guy. I don't know as much as you and, you know, Seek do, like Ben and Seek. I don't know I don't know as much you guys do, but I think I can add something uh, from a writing perspective by being the guy who doesn't know as much. And we thought, yeah, we agree. Because you'll, you'll help us clean scenes up. You'll help us, you know, keep scenes focused, uh, keep dialogue focused. And, uh, and he did. And I think we made a good team. Even though, like, any time you write with someone else... Whether you're good friends or not, there is things you argue about. There's things you get heated about because you're passionate about what you're doing. You just want it to be the best, and you just try not to take things so you know personally, hopefully. And uh, I think all of us, we beat each other up a little bit when it came to the script, but I think in the end, we came up with a pretty cool story. So first, I'll show you just some of that. I don't want to like reveal the, the personal information on here. Uh, there's the Writers Guild stuff. That's like common knowledge online, I think, if you go to their website. But this is the documentation of registration, uh, and I'll read it to you. This is uh, It says, the Writers Guild of America West Incorporated issues this certificate to seek Donnelly for the material entitled Spider-Man 4 Fearful Symmetry uh, by the following James McCoy and Benjamin Item. So it's all three of us on here. Uh, and it's a screenplay. We registered it on uh, September 3rd, 2007. Uh, and it expired uh, September 3rd, 2012. So it, it, you know, when you register a script, it's good for five years. Um, and uh, the I the screenplay I have somewhere, I I, st I thought I put it aside so I could do this episode, and I couldn't find it. So I dug through my closet last night, and I still couldn't find it. But I did find our original uh, proposal. So you see here, Spider-Man 4, uh, Fearful Symmetry, screen, screenplay proposal by Seek Donnelly, Benjamin Item, James McCoy, registered by the WGA in 2007. And this is just like a little pamphlet we put together that tells you the characters, like the plot, um, kind of what our hopes are. We wanted to continue the Sam Raimi uh, storyline, and I think at that point Sam Raimi was still maybe attached, or there was rumors that he might not be, and, and I, I, I don't think everything had completely fallen out. I could be wrong about that, but from our perspective, what, what little knowledge we had, um, that's what, that's what I believed or that's what we believed at the time which is why we pursued this so it was pretty much you know we all met I moved out here like two weeks after Spider-Man 3 came out in the theaters and we all met on the show on the lot and then uh, pretty much started writing the screenplay almost immediately I think it was like a month had passed and then we were like we should write this like so it was like July or August we started writing the script and we finished it by the end of August and then in September we registered it uh, so yeah we and we've spent all month working on it and it was a good time and so the storyline like I said I'll, I'll try to get through it briefly here um but uh so again it's just picking up not too long after the events i think maybe less than a year or po possibly close to a year after the events of spider-man 3 so you know harry osborne is is uh, gone at this point um uh, venom as far as we know is gone and uh sandman is out there on the loose somewhere and Peter and Mary Jane are trying to get their relationship back together and the storyline in this one is that they're kind of kind of together they're working it out but they're it's still like friends you know and neither of them are seeing other people we're not we didn't want to do that like in spider-man 3 where they brought in gwen stacy although gwen is in this storyline uh, i'm a huge gwen stacy fan uh, that was the girlfriend of peter's that i kind of like liked a lot when i was growing up because in the 90s mary jane was just kind of like this really like don't be spider-man don't be spider-man kind of character and and i didn't like the writers writing her that way so i never had a love for mary jane uh, as much as I, you know, probably do now. I appreciate her more now. Um, so I, we did have Gwen still in the storyline. Uh, the characters, uh, the main characters, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, uh, Sarah J. Cravenoff, which is uh, Craven the Hunter, uh, Dr. Kirk Connors, which is the Lizard. We thought it was such a perfect uh, two-movie setup where you mentioned him briefly in Spider-Man 2, and then in Spider-Man 3, he helped Peter try to figure out what the symbiote was. We thought that was a great jumping-off point to continue his story in this in this movie. So we have the two villains being Craven and Lizard. Uh, Mary Jane Watson's in it. Justin Hammer. So we didn't know if the rights where the character for Justin Hammer fell. We didn't know if he was Marvel, because this is obviously before Iron Man came out. Um, we didn't know where his rights were. And I came across the character reading comics, and I was like, you know what? He could be good to use in this movie as someone who takes over um, Osborne Incorporated. Someone needs to run the company. The shares need to go somewhere. You know, if you know anything about business, if that's some, it has to be folded into another company. If someone will buy it, whatever the case is. So we decided to use Justin Hammer to do that. And he's coming in and buying Oscorp. 
Um, and then what you learn is that uh, we start peppering the story of Peter Parker's parents. So we thought there was great closure with Uncle Ben and the Sandman thing in the Spider-Man 3 movie. And we were like, all right, let's move away from the Uncle Ben thing now. And let's talk about Peter's parents. So we did set up in a lizard movie the storyline of Peter's parents, which obviously a lot of that got used in um, in the Amazing Spider-Man movie with uh, Andrew Garfield. Although I am confident none of it was pulled from our script. I don't know how many people read our script at Sony. I just know we turned one in uh, to you know send them to Amy Pascal and we emailed them to a bunch of people. And I don't know if they ever got them, if it went to their assistant or you know I don't know the story. Um, but great minds think alike a lot of times when writing. So. Um, I didn't take, when I saw Amazing Spider-Man, I didn't feel ripped off really in any way. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. The storyline just makes sense to go that way. You're trying to do something different. That's what we were trying to do. So it just worked out. Uh, we have J. Jonah Jameson, Joe Robbie Robertson, Michael Morbius. We put him in as uh, Dr. Kirk Connors' TA, his uh, teacher's assistant uh, in the, you know in college. Um, so he only has a couple lines, but he's like a Romanian graduate student, and he's teaching a teacher assistant to Dr. Connors. And uh, he kind of gets uh, a few little scenes in this because we were hoping to set him up for maybe future movies, but we really just wanted like a, nice, a neat Easter egg in there for fans. Um, Gwen Stacy obviously is in this. Uh, Martha Connors, John Jameson uh, as a NASA, NASA astronaut again. And uh, he kind of is the spokesperson because we liked in the comics where John Jameson went to Ravencroft and became like uh, the head of security there. So uh, Doc Justin Hammer decides to hire John Jameson to be like a spokesman and head of security for the new Oscorp. So we thought that would be a cool way to introduce him and maybe later on down the line tell stories with John Jameson. Um, so we put him in there. Hobie Brown we put in the script and Liz Allen who ended up, Liz Allen gets used in the Homecoming Spider-Man movie. Hobie Brown still not in a Spider-Man movie. I'm bummed about that. I love the Prowler. So we wanted to put him and Liz Allen in there and they're kind of a couple and they're kind of like like when Peter and Mary Jane they're like friends of theirs. And they're like the good couple. Like they're the ones who get along, and they, they, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot of love between the two of them. Uh, they don't fight that much, and they're kind of the ideal couple. And Peter and Mary Jane kind of want that. You know, they when they're around Hobie and Liz, they're kind of like, oh, we want, we kind of want that. We want to be like a, a couple like them. Uh, and then of course they realize they can't be, but then they find how to become their own type of, you know, couple. And then there's Billy Connors, which is uh, Martha and. Uh, uh, Kirk Connor's son. So the storyline, it kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll breeze, uh, breeze over it quickly. Um, the story opens in Africa and you have this lion creeping up on a, uh, like a, an a gazelle or something you know like getting ready like out in the wild and uh this is something i recycled and used in like a comic book script later on because i like the idea so much where the lion jumps out to get the gazelle and then craven tackles the lion like out of nowhere craven tackles the lion and he grabs the lion's jaws and pa like breaks its jaws and kills it and of course that would upset a lot of people but at the same time when you're writing bad guys you typically have to get them give them things to do where you hate them instantly so we wanted audiences to instantly go Oh, that's awesome! But ooh, I hate him. He's killing, you know, lions and, and with his bare hands. Uh, that's not good. You can't do that. Uh, so that's what he does. And then you, we see Justin Hammer show up and say, "Hello, brother." And you're like, you know, of course, you comic fans know they're not brothers in the comic. Uh, Justin Hammer and, and Sergey Kravenoff. But he says, "Hello, brother." He's like, "I want to bring you to New York. I know you've hunted everything out here, and you go back to Craven's, like, like where he's living and out in the wild. And uh, there's all these trophies and animal heads mounted up on the wall. He's like taxidermy city." And uh, and basically Justin Hammer says, come to New York. He shows him a newspaper. He goes, there's a Spider-Man in New York. He's like, you probably haven't heard of him because you've been out here with no technology and nothing. And he's very much like a man of the wild. And he's like, you come you come to civilization with me and I want you to, to make sure this Spider-Man doesn't interfere with what I'm going to do with Oscorp because he's interfered with Oscorp before. So Craven comes back to New York and that's how he gets involved. Uh, meanwhile, Peter, you know, he's trying to have this regular life. The story opens with him at a play of Mary Jane's. She's doing cabaret uh, and she's kind of moved up in the Broadway actress world. And uh, and then at this time, uh, there's like a scout, an agent in the crowd like to, to see if she'll be good for a movie. She does great on stage, but then one of the stage hands comes out with like, you know, a, a bowl on his head and he's like throwing and pyrotechnics everywhere and he's just trying to be he's a big goofy idiot and basically what we wanted to do is we want to establish peter parker has been for this year without like big villains like sandman and and the goblin and venom like without, he's just been fighting like 
like jokes, like the looter, you know, and like like the kid with the big wheel, you know, like we just wanted all these goofy Spider-Man villains. And so when he sees Mysterio, like this guy who's like just dressed up with a bowl on his head and just being stupid, uh, and he's trying to threaten people and stuff, like Peter's like, oh, another one? Like, come on, man, these guys just get sillier and sillier. He's like, first the looter, now Mysterio? He's like, what is this? And so he takes down Mysterio with one punch, takes the bowl off, and you find out it's Bruce Campbell. Uh, because we thought it would be cool for all of his cameos to like build up to him being, uh, you know, Mysterio in this movie. So that was something we came up with we thought would be really awesome. Um, and then after that, the movie goes on, and uh, it's Peter trying to have a regular life, trying to reconnect to Mary Jane. He still works, you know, this friends with Gwen Stacy after that awkward, you know, thing they had in the third movie where he kind of used her. She's kind of distant at first, but then he says, hey, look, you know, I'm sorry about what happened. I was, I was going through a thing there. I'm sorry, me and Mary Jane, you know, we, we have a very complicated relationship, and I didn't mean to drag you into it, and I apologize. Like, please kind of make it up to you. And she says, yeah, you can help me in Dr. Connor's class because I, I don't know what he's talking about in class and neither do I know what Michael Morbius is talking about. So he's like, all right, I'll help you with your homework, but you got to help me with like my literature homework because I'm not very good at like literature. And so she says, okay, I agree. So they they become friends. Uh, but then throughout the movie, you see that she's kind of pining for um, for Peter and Hobie and Liz know it and they say, you know, we know you like Peter Parker. And she's like, yeah, but he's with someone who's great and treats him well. So, you know, like I'm just going to bite my tongue and I'm going to be just like the, you know, the, the friend, you know, and that's kind of how we leave the relationship in the movie movie uh then you have connors who has the sample of the symbiote from the third movie and he takes a sliver of that because uh, he has like a little cup worth he takes a sliver of it he sees that it's starting to multiply uh because we were setting up that it was going to split and have it, it produce it, you know produce asexually and make a, a red one and have the black one still expanding at the end of this movie to set up you know spin-offs for carnage and venom and stuff for their own movies because i think sony was working on that at the time so we had a lot of little things in there that were just kind of peppered in in case they wanted to use it but didn't deviate from the main story because we had dr connor's use that sliver and uh and what he did was he injected it with lizard dna and used the symbiote to replicate with lizard dna and then injected it into himself and the reason he wanted to grow his arm back was because he wanted to hold his son. He wanted to actually hold his son, pick up his son, play catch with his son, uh, all the ways, you know, and he, he wanted to do all these fatherly things that he felt he would never get a chance to do with his son. So his arm grows back and for like a, you know, first chunk of the movie, he's got his arm and then the scales start coming in. And then the halfway point of the movie, Peter Parker goes to school and the lizard is born uh, late at night. Uh, and the movie set during the Christmas time because we were all fans of Batman Returns. Uh, and so we were like, oh, we should set this during Christmas. It'll be great. Uh, Spider-Man shows up to fight uh, the lizard. And meanwhile, this half of the movie, Craven has been tracking Spider-Man. He now knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man because he can smell, you know, and he's like, oh, I smelt that. Like P Parker went to an Oscorp event at the beginning of the movie. He smell. He's like, oh wait, that's Spider Man smell. So Craven's already onto him. So Craven's circling around for the first half of the movie. He's like, he knows about Mary Jane. He knows about uh, Aunt May. He knows about all of Peter's life. And he's like, all right, I'm gonna attack. I'm gonna attack this kid uh, on this night. And he goes to attack him. Follows him to the school. Peter gets into a fight with the lizard, and the lizard beats the living crap out of Peter. Almost within an inch of his life, kills him. And Peter's laying in the snow, broken, beaten, mask ripped, bloody everywhere. And the uh, the lizard like runs off. And then Craven walks out of the shadows and looks. And basically, the reason Craven came to New York was because Spider Man was king of the jungle. And now there was a new king of the jungle, the lizard. So Craven turns his attention to the lizard. He picks up Spider-Man's broken body and he goes and buries him alive at a cemetery. And that way we can replicate the great sequence of Spider-Man crawling out of his grave from the comic books and, and then stumbling his way back home, being found by Mary Jane and the two of them, you know, uh, you know, talking while uh, Craven is hunting the lizard. And the ending of the movie is not some big plan of the villains taking over or anything like that. It's uh, the end of the movie is Spider-Man going to save the lizard from Craven. And Craven shows up. He's all geared out. He's got spears. He's got knives. He's got smoke bombs. He's got all these things. And he's beating the crap out of the lizard. And he's ready to kill him. And re kill him right in front of his family, too, because Martha and Billy are there. And they're seeing that their dad is a monster. And they see Craven trying to kill him. And they're screaming, like, no, don't, you know, don't kill him, don't kill him. There's a man in there. And, you know, he's like, no, there's a beast in here. It's only a beast. He's mutated. He's not a man anymore. And I have to kill it. And I need his head on my trophy wall. So Spider-Man shows up. Uh, he has some antidote that he worked out based off of notes from Michael Morbius's research. Uh, and then his own. He added his own. He cures Dr. Connors, defeats Craven, 
and uh, and and reunites father and, and family, you know, with uh, Connors and his family. Um, and then you know, Craven is taken down. And at the end of the movie, you see Ravencroft, uh, you know, facilities. And inside there, you see a bucket of like a, a glass thing of sand with electricity around it. So Sandman has been captured. You see Mysterio in another cell, like you know, like mumbling to himself. Uh, you know, Bruce Campbell. And then you go down and you see um, Craven in his cell. And basically, what you're seeing is the the Sinister Six. It's like it's like a, a six chambers, uh, and someone is building, you know, these six, putting them all in rooms across from each other. And we thought it would be cool to bring Sandman back in a future movie because we like Thomas Hayden Church, but also we we like the idea of having someone who might turn out to be good on the team, someone who could be swayed to the good side on the Sinister Six. So Sandman kind of fit that perfectly, so he could be tricked into being on the team, but end up, you know, doing the right thing and saving the day or helping Spider-Man save the day if they did a Sinister Six movie, which so did want to do at the time and then what you do is you go in through the camera and you see someone at Oscorp is watching these you know three villains that are captured and then you know there's more you know hopefully to come and the person watching is Justin Hammer but then he takes off his face puts it on a mantle and then you see a face of Peter Parker Mary Jane J. Jonah Jameson Aunt May and you see that underneath the face is just this plain white head uh, of the chameleon and the chameleon was actually dressed as Justin Hammer so he could buy, you know, so he might have killed the real Justin Hammer and bought Oscorp using Justin Hammer's money. And then he also has faces of everyone in Peter Parker's life. And he's like, yep, I know my prey. I know who I'm after. My brother's right where I want him to be. I want, you know, he's captured now, but he's with the rest of the team. And, uh, and we're going to keep putting villains, you know, we're going to keep piling villains up to the point where... Spider-Man is not going to be ready for this. But then you see that the chameleon has connections to Peter Parker's family, his father, his mother, uh, might be the reason why they're disappeared and why they, you know, Peter never had them in, the, in his life. So we changed the origin a little bit there, but we involved chameleon. So, yeah, and we took a few cues from that from the Spider-Man animated series too, which they kind of did a little bit. So uh, so that was our story. And, I, I mean, we wrote the crap out of this. We thought we were onto something. We we were trying to accommodate Sony with, you know, setting up the Venom stuff, uh, the, the own Venom movie, and then setting up Sinister Six. But again we were just writing this of our own it wasn't like sony hired us we weren't hired to do this movie at all we were just people throwing our names in a hat trying to get our script read trying to break it into the break into the industry as writers as, as movie writers and comic writers and hopefully eventually and uh and that was my goal was maybe write a couple movies and use that clout to go write comic books uh that was kind of my goal uh but uh but we all you know had big dreams and uh, and we were all young kids in our like mid-20s and it was uh, it was a good time it was over 10 years ago and uh, i'm glad i have those memories still and i'm glad i get to share that with you today so what do you think of our spider-man script i mean obviously it's not great uh we you know we did our best and like i said if i was writing it now i would approach it from a completely different angle i would have completely different ideas but when you're in your mid-20s you're working with two other people and you're all sharing ideas i thought we came up with something really fun and interesting and i like the idea of not some big big laser at the end of the movie where it was a big master plan of a villain it was just a personal story with a big action scene set in the middle of the city with a giant lizard fighting craven and spider-man in the middle and we just thought that was a great way to end a spider-man movie and kind of tone down how extravagant they got and try to tell something a little bit more personal but while still world building and setting up the rest so that's my story guys let me know what you think in the comments down below thank you for the 1000 subscribers i hope you enjoyed this for my episode and we have a lot more venom stuff coming up this weekend i got my computer working temporarily so i think we're good i'll keep pumping out videos if you guys keep watching them thank you so much like share subscribe all that fun stuff i'll see you in the future peace